Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great <coughs> commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee. be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, thou knowest our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion, we beseech thee, upon our infirmities and those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Mercifully give us for the worthiness of thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the second book of Samuel. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant, David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Whenever I have moved about among all of the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? 
Now, therefore, thus you say to my servant David, thus said the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be the prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares that you, the Lord, will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne for his kingdom forever. And I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Let us read responsibly by a whole verse that portion of Psalm 89 found in your bulletin. I have found David my servant with my holy oil have I announced him. And my arm will make him strong. No enemy shall deceive him, nor any wicked man bring him down. My faithfulness and love shall be with him, and, shall he, sh and he shall be victorious through my name. He will say to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will keep my love for him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my judgments, I will punish their transgressions with a rod and their iniquities with the lash. I will not break my covenant nor change what has gone out of my lips. His line shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Remember that one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you are who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with his commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you <coughs> who were far off 
and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access to one spirit, to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, laid the sick in the marketplaces 
and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. The 9 o'clock service had just finished at St. Christopher's Mission in Bluff, Utah. Father Red had accompanied us on his auto harp. Do you know what an auto harp is? He, 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 he celebrates the Mass, and then he picks up this instrument that's about so big, and he strums and accompanies us as we sing, and the, the Navajo team a uh, musician helped us sing. We'd all worshiped together and had, had, were, were leaving to go to coffee hour. And, and one of the parishioners there at St. Christopher's said to another team member in my hearing, we're so glad to see those blue shirts, those rather shocking blue shirts, this shocking turquoise, the team shirts that all the Navajo team members wear, that shocking blue that matches the polish that the women team members put in our toenails. We're so glad to see those blue shirts. Wow. There we had flown and driven two-thirds of the way across the United States after months of planning and work and team building and raising money and all those things that a team, that a congregation must do to send a team to do some work in a place where there is so much need. Oh gosh, out there in Navajo land, there is so much need, so much is needed. And can I say that so much is received, not only by our partners, but by the team members, by the team members. And I wonder what the people see when they see these t-shirts. What, the, what do they see? Well, I hope that they see, first of all, a team, and a team of people that's committed to the Lord, a team of people that is committed to discipleship, a team that is committed to one another. I hope they see a team of people that's committed to them, to those people who are our partners. And ultimately, I hope they see a group that is sent out, sent out as disciples, sent out and sent out with the ability to share good news, the ability to be nimble, to be flexible, a group of disciples that are well prepared because there is so much that is needed and so much to be received. I want to teach us through this morning's gospel briefly so you can turn in your turn in your leaflets i'm going to use the common english bible but take out your leaflets we're in the 6th chapter of mark and i will point out what comes before at the very beginning it's the story of jesus going to his hometown and how they do not receive him because they know him and Jesus says, everyone, every, every time a prophet is received as a prophet, except in the hometown. And 
he is appalled by the disbelief of the people there. And then, so Jesus leaves his hometown, and he travels about through the surrounding villages teaching, and then he calls for the 12, and he sends them out in pairs and gives them authority for teaching, gives them authority over unclean spirits. So he sends them out. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, not to, to wear sandals, but not to wear two shirts. If only you could see all the team bags that we carry with us. For the team, not for the individuals. The team members can only go with a carry-on bag. But the, all the gear we take goes in these great big bags. So that's what has happened before. And then Herod kills, beheads John the baptizer. And that's what happens immediately before we pick up with this morning's reading. At verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus and told them everything they had done and taught. I, I imagine this as the disciples coming back. I imagine this as the team coming back and we're ready for a team party. You know, we want to come back. We want to talk about all the things that we've seen and we have done the things that were successful, the things not so much. But we want to get back. We want to have some food, and we want to have something to drink, and we want to have something to drink, and talk about it all. Time together. Time to be refreshed. Time to be renewed in the experience. Many people were coming and going, so there was no time to eat. Jesus says to the apostles, come by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a while. Your, your translation reads, a deserted place. That can be read as a deserted place. As, come away to the desert. Come away to the wilderness. Come away to a wilderness place. What does God do to people in wilderness places. In our Old Testament lesson this morning, we heard David talking about wanting to build a place for God, wanting to build a dwelling for God's presence. And God says, I haven't been in a, I haven't, I haven't dwelt in a place like that. I've been on the move. I've been in a, I've been in a tabernacle, in a tent, ever since that time in the wilderness. And what did God do in the wilderness but create a new people? He took a ragtag bunch of people out of Egypt and through 40 years of wandering, 40 years of that intimate contact, intimate one with the other, all that rubbing up against each other that they did, all the grumbling, and the intimate time with God. God was able in the wilderness to create a new people, to create a different community so that when they came out of the wilderness and crossed the Jordan and entered into Canaan, they were able to go on about a new business of being God's people. We know that in the wilderness, God did something special to Jesus, that after his baptism, he was tempted and tested. And once he came out of that, tempting and testing in the wilderness, he started his work. He started the teaching. He started the healing. He started feeding people who were desperate for the word of God. And for the disciples, we can imagine that here, let's get away to a deserted place and let me, Jesus, continue the work that God has begun in you. Let's continue that good work which God has begun in you, preparing you, equipping you to do this work just like you did when I sent you out two by two. They departed in a boat by themselves for a deserted place. Many people saw them leaving and recognized them, so they ran ahead from all the cities and arrived before them. Many people 
saw them leaving and recognized them. I almost imagine the disciples and Jesus all in blue shirts and people could recognize them, see them and recognize where are they going? Where are they? We want to be where they are. And they run on ahead. When Jesus arrived, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. It's as though Jesus has forgotten that the disciples were there. Because he sees people with greater needs even than the disciples need for being with their Lord and Savior, for getting some rest and recuperation with them. Jesus sees the people who are racing about, and he has compassion on them. One of, my writer, one of the writers I read this week talked about this word compassion. And we know com with passion, with passion. But the German, he pointed out, says it even more clearly, to be with suffering, to be with suffering. Jesus was willing to be with their suffering. And this writer, this commentator pointed out that often we hear in our modern ears, we hear the word compassion and we think pity. Jesus took pity on them. And pity is something that we can do from afar. We can pity people after an earthquake. We can pity people after um, a gunman shoots in their community. But that is something we do from afar. Jesus had compassion. Jesus entered into their suffering. And he began to teach them many things. Then if you see... Our reading skips some verses, and what is skipped is the feeding of the 5,000, and then Jesus walking on the water, and we pick up again on verse 53. When Jesus and his disciples had crossed the lake, they had landed at Gennesaret, he anchored the boat, and came ashore. People immediately recognized Jesus, and they ran around that whole region, bringing sick people on their mats to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he went, villages, cities, or farming communities, they would place the sick in the marketplace and beg him to allow them to touch even the hem of his clothing. Everyone who touched him was healed. This is a lot of people running around the countryside. When we come to church, we sort of come in an orderly fashion. When we come, when we come to receive the gifts that Jesus gives us, we come in a rather orderly fashion. Now at 1030, let me tell you, it is chaos at the back. And it can be pretty chaotic up here until Mabel goes around shushing people. But on the whole, we come and we worship in an orderly fashion, but there was great chaos and disorder as people came to Jesus, begging. Do we come on a Sunday morning begging? The people came begging, let me just touch you, touch the fringes on your garment, let me just touch those zitzit, the, the, the garments that uh, uh, an observant Jewish man, the tassels on his cloak. Let me just touch that and I'll be healed. So what do we see here? Do we, do we see or hear Jesus asking for a profession of faith? Do we see or read here anyone saying, I know you can heal me? What we hear and see is people begging, let me just touch. And everyone who does is healed. It is as though this is an epiphany story, a manifestation of all that power of God working in and through Jesus. An epiphany story like the Magi, an epiphany story like Jesus and the baptism, an epiphany story like changing the water into wine, 
Here is a manifestation of the fullness of the power of God working through Jesus. So much was needed and so much was received. What we hear in this story is unlike us who come here seeking healing, perhaps, who come here seeking nourishment in our very orderly, mostly, fashion. The disciples and Jesus were mobile. They were all over the farms, the, the towns, the villages. They were mobile, they were nimble, and they were effective. Most importantly, they were compassionate. They were willing to enter into the suffering of those who come. Now, I wonder if people, you know, ordinary people, people out in the world, if they recognize us, if they recognize the church as a place to go for healing. That is to say, do they recognize Christ's healing presence within the body of Christ, within us? we who are the body of Christ. Now, we've heard all about the millennials. Those of us, you don't even have to be listening to church news. We all have heard it in recent months about the nuns, those who uh, say they, are, they don't go to any church, that they don't have any faith, none, no faith. We've all heard about this. We hear about it in particular with those who identify as being millennials. No faith. Well, I, I spent a little time wondering what they, the millennials or the nuns, how they might see us or not see us, the church, as a place for healing. And then I, and then I thought, oh, be compassionate. Get into the suffering. Don't do it from afar. Do it close. Your sister, Cynthia. So my sister. <laughs> Fortunately, she will not watch us online. So I'll, I'll, it's, it's, she knows I would say this. My sister, reared in the church, big in youth group, doing church sorts of work during high school and college. But now, when she thinks of healing, she thinks of going to a doctor, going to a therapist, taking a yoga class, uh, going to a naturopath, someone who can prescribe who will prescribe vitamins and minerals. She does not see the church. She does not view the body of Christ as a place for healing. She's someone who is, who is committed to raising up community, to justice, to... to um, wider healing, healing the earth, but not related to a church. So I have to wonder how she identifies that. She and others of her intimate group, even though she's older than a millennial, do they associate churches with places of injustice, places, places that are self-serving, places where power is grabbed? rather than being a place for the healing of body and spirit and relationship, a place for restoration. So I ask us, are we here recognized as a place of healing? Or are we recognized as a place of grabbing and of injustice and self-serving? There is so much that is needed. As we survey our culture and our discipleship, I think it is critical for us to be asking ourselves if, as the body of Christ, we are a place of healing, if we are a place of restoration, if we are viewed and experienced as a place of healing. 
being a body of healing, of restoration, body, spirit, relationship, requires that we be nimble and that we be flexible. It requires that we be willing to be instruments of healing not only here, but out there. I would say that we all need to be wearing blue shirts, that we all need to be visible, not just here at 1400 Riverside Drive, but all the way out there, every place, any and every place, to be seen as a place or places of healing. I imagine that when St. Mary Magdalene arrives at St. Lawrence Chapel, people say, ah, we are so glad to see St. Mary Magdalene, not in blue shirts, but we are so glad to see St. Mary Magdalene because we know we'll receive a piece of fresh fruit and we know we will receive ministry. We know we will receive an intimate relationship. We know that someone is compassionate not just afar off, but is willing to suffer with us. Whether it's in the wilderness or after a hurricane or some deserted place or St. Lawrence Chapel, we are called to be there to suffer with, to wear our blue shirt, to be healers, because so much is needed. And we know so much is received. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <clears throat> Reconciled to God by the love of Christ, let us offer prayers for the peace of the world. For Catherine, our presiding bishop. For Leo and Peter, our bishops. 
for Mark and Cynthia, our priests, for this holy gathering, and for the people of God in every place. Lord, have mercy. For all nations, all peoples, all tribes, all clans, and all families. Lord, have mercy. For mercy, for justice, and for peace in the world. Lord, have mercy. For those on vacation, and for safety from violent storms. Lord, have mercy. For all those in danger and need, for the sick and the dying, the poor and the oppressed, for travelers and for prisoners, and for their families. Lord, have mercy. For those who rest in Christ and for all the dead. Lord, have mercy. For ourselves, our families, our companions, and all those whom we love. Lord, have mercy. Let us at this time lift up to Christ our own prayers, all that's on our heart, our own needs, and the needs of our neighbors. I bid you pray for Sonny Robertson, who is nearing death. Pray for his family, for Jane, and for James. Pray for the repose of the soul of those who died in Tennessee in the recent shootings this week. We pray also for our nation and for those who seek to use violence to resolve issues. I ask your prayers for all teachers. as they prepare for return to school in August. I ask your prayers for the people of California as they battle the raging fires. I ask your prayers for all people struggling in their marriages, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lifting our voices with all creation, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, and with St. Mary Magdalene, and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. To you, O Lord. God, our shepherd, hear the prayers we offer today, and touch all peoples with your healing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that, that we have sinned against thee in, thee in thought, word, word, and deed, deed by what we have done, and, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways, to the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy have promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Good morning, all. Welcome. <laughs> Come on back. Good to see you all this morning. Father Mark is with his family up uh, near Orlando today at the uh, church where he grew up. So that's where they are this morning. Do we have any guests or visitors this morning who would stand up and introduce themselves? Anybody? Hmm? All right. There is one very important thing happening this week. And that is our patronal festival, Dr. Park. No communion, no preaching, just prayer and candlelight and music. There are some other upcoming things in your bulletin. Please check them out. The upcoming uh, book and uh, for the book group, some other things. So please do check out what's in your m and and you. Are there any birthdays, wedding anniversaries, or travelers for blessings this week? Traveling, okay. Are you traveling? Might as well stand here. There aren't any, there aren't any birthdays, are they? Then come over here for traveling. We'll just shake it up this morning. Okay. What? To Tennessee. Whoa, are you going to the mountains in Tennessee? Are you going for country music in Tennessee? You have no idea why you're going to Tennessee. Okay. More will be revealed. Okay. Oh God, our heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation and whose presence we find wherever we go, preserve those who travel, surround them with your loving care, protect them from every danger, and bring them in safety to their journey's end. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Traveling mercies. Let us with gladness present the alms and oblations of our lives and labor unto the Lord.
Spirit be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. And gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table. But thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank thee for that thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. May Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path and make you ready to meet him when he comes again in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia.